Thank you, President Allen. Um, just a quick little bio here on Ron, because he's got a lot of cool stuff to talk to us about. Um, Ron was an emergency medical technician for 25 years, uh, from 1980 to 2005. He's a vet Navy veteran. Again, thank you for your service, uh, Ron. Uh, he's been involved in our community for a long time, starting with being in the Boy Scouts. He just let us know that he just got his 55th year pin with them. So he's been involved with them for a very long time. He is a company commander for the local Sons of Union Veterans, Camp 67. And he's a member of the American Legion Post, eight over, uh, American Legion Post number two. He has been a reenactor for 25 years, which is why he's with us here today to talk. So please give a warm welcome to Ron Krishkes. Okay, I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of what I usually do as a lecture because usually the lectures that I give are about 45 to 50 minutes long, and I'm sure you don't have that time right now. But I will give you an overview of some points about the Civil War medicine that I do. Uh, one of the things that I do when I'm out there is I portray a living person that was in the Civil War. My person I portray is Major Conover. He was the uh, surgeon uh, from 1862 to 1865 during the time of the Civil War. He was with the 108th Illinois Volunteer Infantry Unit. Uh, that came out of Metamora and Woodford area. Um, going to give you a little bit about the doctor's training that he had. And he, he was a doctor, but he was actually a school teacher for one year. He taught for the preparatory department of the Walnut Grove Academy. Um, in 1854, he married a woman by the name of Sarah Fisher, who was also a teacher, and she lived in Tazel County. He was born in Morgan County, December 28, 1831. So he was a very young surgeon at the time of the Civil War. Um, in 1856, he apprenticed under Dr. R.B.M. Wilson in Washington before be going uh, to medical school. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, Walnut well, Grove Academy, I want to bring that up real quick because a lot of you would say, well, what, where was that at? That was in Woodford County. And today it's still there. Uh, it is now around the 1900, it became Eureka College. So that was the beginning of Eureka College with Warner Grove Academy. Uh, in uh, 1856, like I said, he, he uh, was under Dr. Wilson as an apprentice. He also went to St. Louis Medical College. He graduated in 1858. He practiced around Eureka area for four years. In 1862, he enlisted as the assistant surgeon in the United States Union Army. And then in 1863, he was promoted to the rank of major and became the regimental surgeon and served the entire time in the war. After the war in 1865, he mustered out. He stayed around for three years in practice, his own practice. Then he moved to Peculiar, Missouri, where he lived for 16 years and passed away in 1886 with heart disease. He was 55 years old. Now, when I said he went to me medical college, don't think it's like it was nowadays. <laughs> medical school was very different, and I guarantee you. Um, one of the things I did back in 2003, the Society of Civil War Surgeons, we did this in around Gettysburg area. I went to what's called a school of the surgeon. I went there on a Friday morning and I left there in the evening on Sunday. What we did was we sat down and did the training, same as the doctors would have had in that time period, so we can get an idea of what to expect when people ask you, what was the training back then? Well, they only met twice a year. <coughs> in the fall was the first semester. Spring was the second semester. They went for eight weeks on each semester. And depending on who was teaching the classes, it was only on lectures. There were no cadavers done because they could not keep the cadavers fresh at that time because there was no ice or anything. So they just had mostly lectures. And according to the person who was teaching them, they went four to eight hours a day. And that's it. There was no formal examination. There's no formal testing. After the, after the 16 weeks, you had a piece of paper. You can go hang a shingle. You're a doctor. 
that's it. You know, that's pretty quick on that. Now, when I talk about sober medicine, like I said, the doctor's knowledge is very minimum when we broke out into the War of 1861. Um, but before that war, there were two important factors, and these factors actually changed the United States medicine as we see it nowadays. From revolutionary time up to the Civil War, medicine is pretty much the same. They did what they did all the time. You know, it was nothing new. But in 1847, two important factors, and this, these things really altered the course of the war. One was a colonel by the name of Manet. He invented a new kind of bullet. Now, prior to the Civil War, they used a round ball. And the round ball traveled maybe three, 400 yards. It didn't do a lot of damage, so you wouldn't have much bone, bones broken. Because the musket they used was they call a smoothbore musket. And I'm talking about it's the barrel. It's smooth inside. So when the ball came out, it just kind of tumbled around. But what he invented was a 58 caliber mini ball. It's a conical shaped bullet. I got one up on the table up there, some of them. And this mini ball is now grooved. You look at it, it's got grooves because the muskets they used was rifled. So when it did, when they fired it, it would spin. And as it spun, it created more force. It can go up to a thousand yards and hit this target. There is a picture up there of what the damage is done. When it hits human bone, it flattens out because it's made out of soft lead. And when it hits that bone, you lose three to four inches of your bone completely. And this is why we had to do amputations in the Civil War because of that. Now, another thing that was invented, I, that's why I usually call it the giver of death. The one that gave life and helped a lot of the soldiers during that time was anesthesia. I know people talk about biting on the bullet. No, they didn't do a lot of that. 95% of all the cases that done in amputations during the Civil War was done under anesthesia. Now, if you put it on the bullet, one of the things that's going to happen is, if I cut on you, what's going to happen to that bullet? You're going to scream. You're going to swallow it. You're dead. <laughs> that's the way it is. But we had chloroform we, we used in the field, basically because they had ether. But ether is flammable. Most of the time when the surgeons worked was in the evening hours until morning hours with candles and lanterns. Uh, if I had ether there and it was leaking, I wouldn't be there no more. It would blow me up. Chloroform wasn't as flammable, so we used it, but it was effective. Basically, we use a, a cone-shaped funnel with a rag or something inside of it, poured a few drops in, and just kept pouring. Now, there are four stages of anesthesia. The first one is when we put the cone over here and we start dripping. Second, you're starting to feel the effects of it. Third, you're under. Fourth, we give you too much, you're dead. <laughs> so this is what we did. But usually what we try to do is when we do our amputations, we usually try to start on the second stage. As soon as you start feeling it, we start cutting. And we try to get it done before you pass out. To wake you up is very simple. We take our hands, we slap you. And then we slap you until you're awake. Now, the amputations that were done during the Civil War is very quick. Like I said, the bones are broken. It takes 10 to 12 minutes for one surgeon to operate from start to finish. That's, and we have to be done quick, you know, let's say, because of the anesthesia. <coughs> so, and nothing was done sterile. We never washed our instruments. We never washed our hands. We never washed the tables. So it was patient to patient. Um, and usually it was done by a, what you call a circular motion. We would take a knife and you make a circular cut completely around, take the saw, you cut it down, bones cut off, and they always did it at a joint. They never did it mid shaft. So they had a joint here or a joint here, that's where you would do it because of the prosthetics that we give you afterwards. During the Civil War, there was about 50 to 60,000 amputations done. It's a long time ago. So it was better to live without your limb than not. Now there is an exception to the rule and what I'm going to tell you. Most of the time when we take the amputation limb off, we throw it into a pile, then later it's burned or it's buried. There is an exception to this rule and that is religion. There are some times that we wrapped it up and it's going to smell, I know that, but we wrapped it up and somehow 
let you keep it. The reason for that is there is a rule where some of the soldiers, because of the religional beefs, did not want to have their part away from them. Because when they got buried, they had to be very whole according to the religion. So this is when one of the exceptions to that. It had to be done. Now, we had to get to you within 24 to 48 hours to do the operations uh, because you get, usually get what we call hospital gangrene. Uh, and when that sets in, you're pretty much gone. Now, if you got shot between the neck and the abdomen, we considered you dead. You may not be yet, but we will because we've not had the knowledge of the organs inside. And plus, the sterile, unsterile conditions is going to kill you anyway. So, by being shot, it's not one thing because that's not really the, the biggest killer in the Civil War. I mean, they fought, they shot each other, got amputations and everything. The biggest thing was diseases. Um, we had no, you know, when you call antibodies or anything like that, or shots or anything to give the guys. So chickenpox, measles, uh, mumps, it ran rampant. The reason for that is one reason. If you think about the time period, most of the people lived on farms and ranches. Nobody actually lived in the town. So when you live by yourself, you're kind of isolated. So if you got chicken pox, well, nobody else could get it unless they came to visit you. The doctors only came out to your ranch or you went to his office. So that's the only way you could transfer it. But when you got a thousand soldiers lined up in tents beside each other and somebody gets it, it's going to run rampant. It's going to take a part the army. But two to one, for everyone that got shot and died from the bullet, Two died from a, a disease which they could never ever control very well. And that was dysentery because of the food they ate, the water they drank, the injuries they suffered, uh, pneumonia. This thing here, dysentery, killed more people. Um, there was over about a million cases of disease in the Civil War. There were about 750,000 deaths. In fact, if we take all the wars we've had since the Civil War, None of the wars, uh, American deaths, would equal the amount of the Civil War. That's on both sides. Confederate. Confederates considered American no matter what. Now, the basic command of the Union Medical. Now, the Confederacy did not have a, a actual medical staff. Mostly their doctors were just by themselves or they had somebody who had a system. They did not have a current medical staff like the Union Army. We were better equipped. We had our own suppliers. We had a more chain of command to follow. I am the regimental surgeon. I am assigned to a, a group of about 1,000 men. My job is to do all the operations and maintain the order. So I would be operating from, like I said, from, from nighttime to early morning. There is an assistant surgeon, but his job was to triage the bandage to prepare the patients for me. We did have what we call hospital stewards. This is a male nurse. We did not have many female nurses. Uh, there were some, Mother, Mother Pickertine, Clara Barton. <coughs> These were very, I'm going to say, elite and top of the list for them. The male hospital steward could be a person that maybe went to school. Uh, medical college, but afterwards he didn't finish it, so he can get his training in 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 an uh, open field, and that's basically what it is. Most of the doctors didn't do much surgery, you know, so it was all open field. So my doctor, he was a regular doctor, for the year he was assistant surgeon, he learned how to do surgeries. So the next time they can hand him the saw and say, "You're the now the surgeon." The hospital stewards are the male nurses. And they were in charge of the wards at the hospital. They also assisted me in surgeries. Now, the women, some like I said, some were nurses. Now, I'm going to have to apologize to the women because I'm going to be a little bit rude here. But to be a, a woman nurse in my regiment, we had four rules. And they are very rude as like you can be. One, you had to be unmarried. Two, you had to be plain. Very plain. You had to wear a very plain dress, no hoop skirts, 
black, brown, gray, very plain. Um, the reason for this is they figured that a married woman would coddle the patients, or if a pretty woman was there, they would spend more time trying to flirt than they're trying to heal. So this is the reason why they were very hard to get a woman out there, because the doctors at that time felt women belonged in homes, taking care of the homes, not out in the field taking care of soldiers. So the last thing was, if I told the woman to jump, she better jump from, or I'm gonna have her arrested. She'll be gone. Um, like I said, this is pretty much, you know, the medicine part of it. Now, like I said, most of the time they did get on, on the job training, and this is how they learned to be a surgeon. There are quite a bit of advancements from the Civil War that we are now today should be thankful for. It seems like every war we have, an, an advancement of some sort comes out of it. Something new we have, something that's better than we had before. One of the things was hospitals. Because when we had the amputations, where were we gonna put the patients afterwards? Because it took them almost six months to a year for a soldier to heal from an amputation. So you had to put them somewhere. Uh, prior to the Civil War, there were no hospitals. Lucy, that was the insane or the asylum places that we had. So we had to have hospitals. After the war, it worked so well that civilian doctors later started using the hospitals. Uh, triage came out of the Civil War because now we had to kind of choose who's going to get what, who's going to go first. So we had to choose who's going to get to die, who's not going to die. So the triage became a very important thing during the Civil War. Another thing is ambulances. This became a big thing because prior to the Civil War, they had musicians, uh, people who were maybe cooks or somebody like that. And what those guys did, they supposed to go out to the field, pick up the patients and bring them back. But the problem was when the bullets started flying, where'd they go? The opposite way. They didn't want to be out there and get shot at. It wasn't their job, they said. Of course, they got in trouble for that, but so we had to have a way to get the patients off the field within 48 hours. So now we had designed ambulances. The first ones was kind of a two wheel cart. It was very rough, but it was rudimentary and it did work. Then we went up to a more of a four wagon, four wheel wagon, and it started working real well. But then who was gonna take the wagons out there? So we had to take soldiers and train them to become ambulance sergeants or ambulance attendants. Now, as a regimental surgeon, I would not carry any weapon on me because I am a non-combatant. The ambulance attendants were not carrying weapons. The only person who carried a weapon in the medical field at that time was the ambulance sergeant. He would ride a horse and go up and down the line and direct the ambulances to where they need to go. He did carry a weapon because he had to protect the ambulances from the Confederacy. So he's the only one that would at that time wore a pistol or a sword. Uh, another thing that came out of the Civil War was prosthetics. Uh, once you got this patient home, what are we going to do with him? He's got no arm, no leg. So they started kind of looking around and designing prosthetics. One of the gentlemen, Sergeant Hooker, he um, lost an arm. He went home. He said, this ain't going to work. So he designed his own prosthetic arm. It's worked very well. And eventually he owned a prosthetic company called Hooker Prosthetics. So he learned how to, to do that and it advanced quite a bit. Uh, like I said, after the war, nursing very much jumped off. Some of the colleges started allowing women to go into the, to the program. Um, Clara Barton, Mother Bickerdike got these things started. So yes, it was important for them. Are there any questions or anything? Yes. So the ambulances that you talked about, was that something that both the North and the South utilized? Or did one start it? The uh, South, the only way they got the ambulances was to take them from us. <laughs> the South did not have ambulances as per se. I said they did not have a medical department per se. They just had doctors. Uh, that is the reason why we had an ambulance sergeant 
wearing a pistol to protect them. Um, but most of the time, they did not attack them. Uh, there is one instance where I, I researched and I did some more study when I was out of Gettysburg. When the Gettysburg battle was going on, uh, the Confederates were on the rise coming over. They had a Union Ambulance Corps was situated down in near Devil's Den. Uh, they were loading patients up. The Confederates stopped. They did not advance further. And then when the wagons were loaded and, and pulled away, they actually uh, gave out the rebel, rebel yell and they did not attack them. It is kind of a gentleman's war, you know, you kind of honored back then, but you know, you don't try to kill the medical corps back then. Um, the, you know, most of the enlisted and officers were more the ones they attacked. So yes, we Owens had the had them. Any other questions or anything? Yes. Uh, what area of the country did you serve in? My uh, major Conover served in the Western Theater. Uh, if you take the Civil War, it, the Eastern Theater is more towards Maryland and that, and we were more towards the, the Mississippi area. Uh, the 108th fought down in Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Louisiana. Uh, this is where their field is. They did like Vicksburg and that, so they were more Western. Uh, if you look the way I'm dressed, I'm more of a Western theater person because most of the gentlemen from the East we wore kepis. If you look at General Grant, he was wearing a more of a slouch hat. So most of the guys from the Western theater we wore slouch hats and more than we gave up on the kepis. I do have one, but I don't wear it as much. So I try to stay more of a casual dress. How did you get your assignment <laughs> as this person? Most of the time, uh, the assignments for the surgeons was given by the mayor of the town, one of the regiments being formed. So in Metamora, whoever was in charge of that town at that time would assign. Um, I would go there, I would enlist myself, and then he would assign me to a unit that's being raised. Most every town raised their own, their own units and their own medical corps. Uh, if you look at now today's army or air force or whatever, the mass unit is one huge unit. Back then, every regiment had their own hospital corps. So 108th would have their own surgeon, their own medical staff. Uh, the 57th would have another surgeon and medical staff. That's separate from me. Every regiment would have their own people that would be assigned to them from that area. You know, uh, either enlisted or directed into it. You as a as an actor, how did you get this person out of your sight? Um and me as train conover? Yeah, yeah. I chose him. Uh my ancestry is Metamore. I'm I got a German ancestry. So Metamore is my where my ancestry came from. Uh, we are allowed to you can for a while early two thousand I was portraying Dr. Winnie was from Sandwich, Illinois. And then somebody else came up and they were doing that one. So I changed and then moved over to uh, Major Conover. Now, um, we choose our own, but sometimes I will flip myself around. Um, now, I'll select next year. I'm doing some research now for Bishop Hill. They have contacted me. They're doing a big, huge thing. I don't know if it's an annual thing or something next year in May. So I'm going to be betraying Major Zeering of the 57th Illinois. So I'm doing research on him now to figure out what he was and how he lived and everything. And he's mostly Swedish. So I'm going to go from German to Swedish now. <laughs> how did so. you get paid? How, how did you get paid and how much did everybody get paid? Enlisted men and officers? Yes, uh, usually the enlisted it was around maybe twelve, thirteen dollars a month. Um, the officers varied on what they got paid. I did research Dr. Conover, and I'm going to tell you he was pretty good. Um, for a month, he was paid uh, about one hundred sixty dollars a month for his services. Um, most of the time, the surgeons got paid a little bit better because we had to furnish our own uniforms sometimes. 
you know, it wasn't issued to us. So, and some of the equipment we had, we had to buy ourselves. So we got paid a little bit better. There's a question. So, on. yeah, my question is about your equipment. So now today, how did you find all these artifacts? Well, uh, when I've traveled, I've been to a lot of the battlefield sites out east and stuff. I, to, I usually go to different places like flea markets or antique stores. Um, I was telling somebody earlier about a, a funny thing that I did find, and it's, it's kind of hilarious. Um, I went to a flea market kind of on the Spoon River Drive, and this lady had some stuff sitting out on the table. There were cooking in, in instruments and stuff like that, like pots and pans and spoons and that. And there's this one instrument. It's a silver, silver tube. has a very narrow end to it and has a plunger that goes in and out. Now, I know what that was because I've researched and I have four of them myself. And I thought, hey, another one ain't going to be too bad. I'll buy it because of the price. I told the ladies, how much you want for it? She goes, five bucks. Okay. I got it right away. And she goes, well, you've got, you must do something about cooking. I said, no, ma'am. This is an intimate tour of the Civil War. <laughs> well, and she about fell on the floor. <laughs> but I've gone, I found things in, you know, like in flea markets where there may be a tool or something. I found some solves there. there. Um, I do have a rare find when I was up in South Dakota for something. There was a bookstore. I decided to go into it. And in the back, they had these pile of books that they got donated from different people. So I spent about an hour going through it. I bought a book for $5.75. It was in, in good shape. It was an 1849 book on surgery. So I travel around and I try to find what I can can. And then some stuff I've gotten from people themselves. Uh, maybe a family member, um, you know, was somebody they knew was in the Civil War. They said, we want to do with this. We don't want it to go to waste. So they'll donate to me. Um, it's like, Right now, I got something that the Museum of Civil War Medicine wants to steal from me. Uh, a year and a half ago, a gentleman came up to me and he said, I got a neighbor that passed away and his son, you know, had a box. And I went that, I took the box from him because he was going to destroy it. And I opened it up. It's an original 1862 pannier box of the Civil War. A pannier box is what they had their drugs in them. And it still was in good shape. But he was going to take and throw it away. So I collect it different ways. Whatever I need, I can get. Um, if I brought all my instruments that I got right now, different saws and everything, it'd be four tables in here, four eight-foot tables. I have close to, I've had it estimated around $16,000 that I own. So, and I have put them out before. Next. Uh, so thanks uh, for being here. We really enjoyed you and your talk. Um, so I read the headlines uh, recently that the I had Mickey Mantle cards and they were they were sold for twelve million dollars and I'd sure like to know where those are now. Um, but anyway, um, the things that you have, I, do they sell for a lot of money? Uh, what, what are the prices of? Um, well, the kit that's up there right now that's a reproduction kit. Um, when I got into it more back in around 2002, there was a company that actually made doctor's instruments down in Tennessee, not so Tennessee. Uh, but they would, if they if you wanted, they would go back and make an exact duplicate of the surgeon's main kit for you. Uh, that kit right now, I bought it for 2,500. If I wanted to sell it right now, it's five thousand dollars. And I use that to do my all my demonstrations out in the field. And I'm talking about is when I go out to a reenactment, I set up a full small field hospital. I have a mannequin that sometimes, but sometimes I can get a light person to volunteer for me. <laughs> um, but I have makeup and stuff I could put on them. And we actually demonstrate how to cut a hand off or a leg off. Um, I've had one guy help me one time. He was an actual leg amputated person from the military. And he he would enjoy the Civil War, so he would come out, and I would put a maybe a cow bone up there or something, and then we would actually cut it off. So, um, but there there is some items. Uh, the scissors, the big tall wooden thing, is my stethoscope that I would have used. There is an original saw that's on the table. It's called a, a giggly saw. 
I know it sounds like a, you, you're laughing, but it is called a giggly saw. And that is used kind of like around the legs. You just pull it up and go back and forth, kind of like a chainsaw. Uh, there's the other instrument. It look, kind of looks like a conical shaped tool. That is a trip bind. Since the Egyptian times, trepanation was done um, on people. What it is is to release the, the pressure from the brain. If you got hit in the head, your your head's going to bleed. You got to relieve the pressure. So they actually would draw a hole in your head and leave it open three, four days, and let it drain, and then you sew it back up. But uh, I have a tourniquet up there. I have my ether cone, and I have my can of chloroform. I have a tourniquet that we use up there. And like I said, when the, we make things on our own, there is a small little inhaler, looks like. And that is called a Chisholm inhaler. It was invented by Dr. Chisholm of the Confederate Army um, because they couldn't carry the cone around. So he invented a little inhaler and he put up to the nose, drop chloroform in it, and it'll put you to sleep. But uh, the bone saws up there, my knives and stuff, it's all there. Any other questions? Go ahead and get Ron. Uh, how, what technique or uh, materials did they use to close the wounds with after they were uh, done operating? Okay, there, that's a new technique for them. Like I said, that's another advancement. Um, prior to the Civil War, they usually used a cautering iron. What I mean is be a small blunt end on it, they put it into the heat, and they make it hot, and then they would burn all the garbage shut. But this did so much damage that the doctors, about around 1863, decided that's too much damage. So they started doing what's called stitching. And they would have a tenacrum, which is a hook instrument, pull the arteries out, tie them off, and let them go back. And then they would use a mustard plaster and dressing on top of the stuff. But it was a new way. Um, they still did some cauterization for one technique. I don't have it here. I thought I was going to bring it and I forgot it. Um, I have an original tonsillectomy tool. Basically, it's just a long rod with a little circle at the end. You pull back on it, and there's a blade inside, and it just snips off your tonsil. Now, that they still cauterize. So once they tongue, you suck it up in there and they cauterize you. <laughs> but they, they were pretty good about learning new ideas and stuff. And like I said, it was a turning point in medicine because they had to learn new things. Um, in fact, yes, yeah, so did we have something? Do you have another? Yeah, I was going to say one thing. I got one thing that's going to make everybody kind of look like uh, laugh about it. I got it over, I should have got it out. It's in my card over there, but I didn't know if I was going to use it or not. Um, around 1848, Dr. Samuel P. Chase, he was a pharmacist. He invented a new machine called a pill machine, which actually is a roller with makes little lozenges and stuff on it. And uh, he developed it. And in actually 1847, he started using it. In 1848, it was patent. But one company used that to make throat lozenges. And you know what? Those throat lodges are still around today because they were so sweet and sugary, they actually became candy. And uh, Northeastern Confectionery Candy Company bought the patent. I'm talking about nickel wafers. During the Civil War, they were called hub wafers. But that had been around since 1847. I'm sure some people have eaten those little nickel wafers. Of course, they're a lot different than they were back then, but they were back that far long ago. I know you travel around quite a bit. You were telling me a little bit. Like, I think they'd be interesting to hear kind of all the places you've been. You talked about Gettysburg and all that. Just some places you've been and, and presented. Well, I've attended a lot of the uh, Gettysburg anniversary ones, the 145th, 150th, 140th. I've attended those. Um, I've been to Andersonville for a conference. And that was a very horrifying place. I mean, it's in a prison for the Union Army. They had a Union Army at uh, I've been to Mill Springs. I've been all around um, Franklin, Tennessee. I've been there several times doing things for them there. Uh, if you ever get a chance, talking about Franklin, Tennessee, it is a unique place for someone to go and see something because there's a place called the Carnton Plantation. It's a C-A-R-N-T-O-N. It's an Irish name, and that's why it was called Carnton. The, the guy who owned it was not that name. It was a different name. But the Carnton Plantation is a museum now. 
Um, it is very unique. It was a Confederate hospital. And it is really unique to see because you can go inside and you can see actually go upstairs to the upper level where they operated at. You can still see the rings where the tables were at and where the buckets are, everything else is got blood. It is a very horrifying thing to see, but it's very neat. I've been there many times. Um, but I've been all around. I've been um, Perryville. I've been to that one several times. One thing about Perryville is unique because they allow the reenactors to actually sleep and reenact on the original ground, just like Mill Springs does. The only thing we can't do is dig in the ground. We have to have our fires or anything above ground because it's the original ground and they don't want us digging in it. Um, but I've been several places. I did have one unique story about one place I was at. Um, that was Vicksburg. I went, attended that one several times. And one place I would not go back to is called Raymond, Mississippi. And we'll never go back near that place ever again. Me and my wife had a very bad thing. Uh, Raymond, Mississippi is right close to Vicksburg. We were hungry. We decided to go there, sit down and have some lunch. I found a restaurant. Now I'm in my uniform. Sat down. Manager came out and said, sir, there is a door. Leave now. And I was refused service. He said I was totally in his ground. He would not allow me to be there. So, I mean, there's some places that, we, you know, like down in Franklin, Tennessee, there's a small town near Franklin, Tennessee, that if we go to, they will, they will not uh, save our lives. If you're wearing a uniform, don't go there, they said. You won't live. So there's still some places that you got to be careful where you go when you're doing the reenactments. Um, 